have Calvin Yu from BD, Renee Kwashi from CTA, and Kristen Size from Verily. Hi. Great. Hi, Renee. Um, before we start our, our panel discussion, um, I was going to have everyone go through a quick uh, introduction. Could you start, Renee? Sure. Uh, Renee Kwashi. I am the Vice President of Digital Health at the Consumer Technology Association. Great. Thank you. And Calvin? Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Calvin Yu. I'm an infectious disease clinician, researcher, former hospital administrator. Uh, I'm currently the Vice President of Medical and Scientific Affairs uh, for the U.S. region for Becton Dickinson. Great. Thank you, Kevin. So great to have you here. And Kristen. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Kristen Saez. I lead the study devices group at Verily. Uh, I'm actually a mechanical engineer uh, by training, so I've done a lot of product development, but I now lead uh, teams that work with our clinical studies platform, as well as our partnership with iRhythm. Great. Thank you. So our discussion here is shifting a little bit deeper um, into kind of the action around inclusivity in product development and getting into action around that. Um, let's start with you, Kristen. Um, I think the timing, the timing of these tools is really great. Verily and on Duo um, had an announcement last week regarding their commitment to DEI. Um, with your deep expertise, not only in clinical, in clinical studies, but also in product development, um, what gets you excited about kind of this groundswell and the toolkits launching? No, I think it is really timely. And I think this is a topic that's at the, the top of a lot of people's minds. You know, our mission at Verily is to bring precision health to everybody. And to, the only way we can do that is to meet people where they are. Um, you know, and people want to think that they're empathetic to other people's needs, they want to put themselves in other people's shoes, but it's only possible to a point. And so I think having, you know, diversity in the inclusion, which is, or in the organization, which is one of the things that's, that's called out in that post is sort of the, the first piece of that. Um, I think in general, you know, my experience is that people in this space really want to build inclusive products that, that you know, they don't say, start saying, no, we don't want to. Um, they start with good intentions, but as budgets get tight and timelines get tight, these inclusive features start to become nice to haves or hey, we'll, you know, add that after. Um, and I think that it gets, you know, harder and harder to do that the further you are in that product development process. So, you know, if you release an app in English and then say, I'm going to add Spanish afterwards, if you haven't thought about how are you going to build the code or how are you going to build the AI or the UI, then it gets really difficult even just to like add that second language. And so I think, you know, we have to be able to start from the beginning thinking about these questions. Um, and Celine mentioned earlier PPG, that's a technology that's innately difficult. Um, but if you start testing the development early on, you can overcome some of those, um, those challenges. And so I think these toolkits help in two really concrete ways. The calculator that you just showed, I think shows the business value from the start. So it helps the teams continually prioritize, including those inclusive elements and putting it in front of the business leaders and saying, hey, this is why it's important that we put these here. They're going to help us capture additional market value. I think the other one, which I worked on and particularly love is the framework. Um, I love the fact that there are questions to ask along the way and that the teams can really use those to highlight their gaps in their ability to understand different populations. So where can they not step into other people's shoes? Where do they need to go and get external input and talk to others and get data to fill in those gaps? Fantastic. And that's, and that's really kind of the, the root of the framework, right? To make it as easy as possible and straightforward as, as possible, instead of having a, a long kind of encyclopedic tome um, addressing the issues like what's the step-by-step -step process. We love it. Um, in, in your experience um, and thinking about how do we get these in the hands of people, um, it's one thing for these to exist, and it's one thing to build a business case for um, the executives. What about incentives for teams? 
So I think one thing that we've been trying to do is actually to build it into our formal development process. So requiring some of these questions to be evaluated when say you're developing your product requirement specification, when you're doing your user needs development at the very, very beginning, making sure that you're actually um, checking off the boxes, so to speak, that you've actually done this thinking and you've gone through a, a checklist or these kinds of questions of the framework. Um, and so making it a requirement, I think, you know, sort of gives people license to do the work they want to do anyway, um, mm -hmm. because it's built into, into the overall process and the deliverables. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's an, a great match to think about um, your perspective, like it gives people liberty, like you have the formality of it and the opportunity to do this great work. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Um, Calvin, I'd like to jump to you. Um, you have a unique perspective with your combination of being a practitioner and now being at one of the largest global medical devices in the world. And we talked about um, getting to close to the users, right? Ultimately, we're here to serve the patients. Um, share with, I would love for you to share your perspectives on um, early user testing. Sure. I, you know, I, th I think, you know, in this process, um, it's helpful to sometimes take a step back and look what's common in the industry rubric and then what's common in, in healthcare delivery. Um, you know, and one of those things that they have in common is that in industry, um, beta testing is uh, critical to gather insights for product improvement, but healthcare systems actually do a similar process when launching patient safety initiatives. So they, they pilot the first version at a particular medical unit or a few hospitals. Um, work out the inevitable snafus, because there always are. And then they scale the program across the board uh, system-wide. And because of the institutional practice in both med tech and frontline um, healthcare, there's a natural understanding that first phase products or first phase programs, if you will, may need intentional iterative improvement um, in order for the final output to actually be of, of use. And um, you know this, this gets complicated, unfortunately, when the patients get involved and we have to have patients to um, to prove that either a product or a program is actually successful because um, some patients, depending on their um, background or experience, uh, may view this process as experimental research. And even worse, there can be inherent bias in the beta, beta testing process as patients opt out because of this perception. And you know, these patients are typically those that have had a history of actual non-consensual ex true experimentation. Um, Ernest brought up the Tuskegee experiment, um, or, or populations that have been marginalized in society historically by the medical community themselves, like the LGBT population. And so, um, you know, reviewing the toolkit um, and the resources, you know, it struck me that providing a systematic checklist that helps evaluate key considerations that highlight unintentional bias that can be applied to race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or exclusionary um, thinking in general even though it's unintentional, is pretty valuable. And so this process is, is actually critical, um, as we've seen throughout um, you know, uh, healthcare, and particularly in my specialty, infectious diseases, fear and distrust in certain patient demographics. So I'll give you a few examples. In the 90s, where life-saving protease inhibitors made the triple cocktail and made HIV something um, that you could survive, a lot of patients that needed it uh, refused it at first because of just inherent distrust. Um, this occurred again 20 years later with hepatitis C medications, which were actually curative, uh, not just you know, keeping it a, a chronic disease, but actually curing. And you know, similar, different patient demographics, oftentimes refusing to be in those clinical trials or even when they were fully FDA approved. And then now we're seeing the same phenomenon with HPV vaccines and COVID vaccinations at the latest. And so um, you know, it behooves us to have a systematic process that helps developers think about inclusivity and these different points of view so inclusivity can mean different things. Um, it can also mean people that just harbor a different uh, point of view um, from the R&D phase through to product launch and marketing. And so um, we, we should, you know, we can't keep on developing new products in a vacuum and then leave it at the foot of uh, frontline healthcare providers. You know, I've been on that side for 20 years uh, to pick up the slack. They need our help to optimize user testing and for as many different applicable demographics as possible. And so if, if that process happens, both product success and healthcare delivery benefits. Um, so it's a win-win situation. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing the um, kind of the historic, um, the historic patterns that we see and the the motivation to make sure we don't do that um, now, as we have. Um, this great opportunity in front of us. For the toolkit that we have in the development side, um, what gets you most excited? I think, and, and I think um, uh, Kristen sort of touched upon this, I, th I think uh, sort of hardwiring and embedding the, um, the sort of uh, holistic environmental survey on, okay, you've, you've developed a product, but have you thought of this? Or, um, you know, even most hospitals know what their case patient case mix looks like. And so that tool that um, populates, okay, if you have a certain penetration of this demographic, what, what would that look like? Um, and, and so, you know, that's why data is and accurate data is so critical because I'll give you another example. So where I practiced for 20 years in West LA, 60% um, of my patients were African-Americans. So if you used like a traditional, well, you know, maybe 20% or, maybe 15% of the population is African-American and that's, your, that's what you shoot for, it's not applicable to where, where I practiced. And so um, the fact that you can actually pick and choose and tailor it to your patient case mix um, is extremely helpful because you know, we live in a very large country and what's true in one section isn't true for another section or, or hospital. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And that really, where it takes me to think about is ultimately the people, right, going again to the people that we're serving and thinking about we're in this world of the consumerization of healthcare. And it's great to have you at this point, Renee, chime in, um, someone uh, heading the healthcare initiative side of the Consumer Technology Association. Um, let, uh, first of all, um, I want to thank you. I want to point out that CTA and Don done a lot of work together and that you continue to push forth uh, in the healthcare space and be part of Data CC. So I really appreciate that. Um, with the grounds fall right now in, in inclusivity and equity, um, what is, what is it? How does a how would you think a consumer tech product developer should look at this toolkit? Right in order, like they're playing in a new space. Um, often they're playing in a new space, and you know how do we make sure that they get these in their hands so they first don't make things worse, but have the opportunity to make things better? Yeah, thank you for having me. And here at CT, really value our uh, partnership with Dine. So thank you very much, Jeff, for having. Uh, look, the fact of the matter is there are many opportunities to promote equity in the life cycle of the digital health solution, right? From design, technical development, and deployment of the solution in the market. And in fact, many developers, particularly on the consumer tech side, already use practices like uh, user-centered design in developing their products. The problem is many developers often do not include diverse and inclusive set of people in the design process, right? So when you end up having is a lack of usability in certain populations which deepens the digital divide, which fuels greater inequity in the city or something that we always talk about. But the concern we always hear from developers, listen, equity is not my area of expertise. The known unknown, so to speak. I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to find resources. I don't know where to incorporate, incorporate learnings into my product design. I don't know where to begin. Where do I find the information and resources? Well, this is a phenomenal toolkit, right? Because this toolkit really speaks to the concerns we hear from the consumer tech developers. First, um, the toolkit really makes the business case for why inclusive elements should be incorporated, right? This really speaks to the business side of the consumer tech developer's brain. The second, just as importantly, even if you say to yourself, hey, this is very important for me to consider I need guidance on when in the process these elements should be incorporated and more importantly, how to incorporate. So this, the, these suite of products really uh, marry two incredibly important elements that I think are often mis missing from our equity discussion, particularly from the consumer tech developer side, which is again, the, finan the financial case for the importance of equity, uh, an appropriate measurement, as opposed to the idealistic aspirational talk that I think a lot of consumer tech developers don't quite fully understand 
because it's really untethered from business considerations. And then also providing a roadmap for those without expertise to start including long ignored elements of the product design and deployment. Um, so really exciting. Um, finally, uh, developers have a one-stop shop uh, that really provides not only the business case, but really the roadmap that I think is incredibly 